Relations Council. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to tonight's program, What Lies Ahead for Global Jewish Advocacy in 2021 and Beyond. My name is Deborah Barton Grant, and I'm honored to be serving as the CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Indianapolis. And we are thrilled to welcome David Harris, the CEO of the American Jewish Committee into a conversation with Jewish Hoosiers from across Indiana tonight. And I've no doubt that this off the record discussion will be fascinating. During the introductions, we'll learn about AJC, but I would first like to share a bit about our Federation's relationship with this impressive and critically important international Jewish organization. Each year, through our annual campaign, Federation is proud to support many national partner organizations, including the American Jewish Committee. JFC, JFGI thinks of AJC and other national organizations as critically important partners doing the work that aligns with our mission and does so on all of our behalf, which is why we are so happy to be bringing AJC and David Harris to the Indiana Jewish community tonight. We cannot lend our local support to national and international organizations without our donors who enable us through your gifts to our annual campaign to help Jewish communities in Israel and around the world. So first of all, I wanna say thank you. Thank you to all of our donors who support our annual campaign year in and year out. So here's how the evening is going to unfold. We will hear from a couple more people before the main event, including Miriam Dant, the president of the JCRC Board of Directors, Lawrence Bulletin, the executive director of the AJC office in Chicago and a fellow Hoosier, former Hoosier, Norman Kempler, a longtime Hoosier, originally from Fort Wayne, who is now a local member of our Indianapolis Jewish community. He and his wife, Carol, are proud supporters of the AJC, and he will be introducing David Harris for us tonight. We also have Lindsay Mintz, our executive director of our JCRC, who will be leading the conversation with David Harris. And then following the conversation, Jacob Mildner, the Associate Director of AJC's regional offices will, will field questions from all of you in our audience. Just as a reminder, this is a Zoom, Zoom webinar, which means that all of our attendees are muted and off screen. If you have a question, we ask that you type that into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we will be filtering those to Jacob later in the evening. So thank you, sit back and enjoy this conversation with David Harris. Thank you all for being with us. Miriam. Thank you, Debbie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam Dant and I'm proud to be serving as the board president of the Jewish Community Relations Council. Before telling you about JCRC's partnership with AJC, let me share a brief description of the JCRC. Nearly 80 years ago, during the midst of World War II, Jewish communities from throughout the state of Indiana came together to form the Jewish Community Relations Council. We're a nonpartisan organization tasked with conveying the Jewish community's interests and concerns to policymakers and civic leaders. We're proud to advocate for the Indiana Jewish community, and we take seriously our charge to combat anti-Semitism through relationship building and education. Our mission on a local level overlaps with AJC's mission on a national and global level, which is why JCRC and AJC Chicago have been working together to strengthen our partnership. For example, last summer, after weeks of protests regarding racial justice in cities across the country, AJC partnered with the NAACP to launch a Black Jewish Unity Week to help both communities deal with anti-Semitism and racism. Our JCRC eagerly joined in to amplify the various programs and days of action with our local partners in the black community. We've also partnered with AJC Chicago to confront anti-Semitism right here in Indiana. After AJC released its shocking report on anti-Semitism last fall, which includes a glossary of hate, we had conversations with several of our community partners and, educate, and educators to share the findings and walk through the guide. Earlier this month, 
we partnered with AJC again, hosting a bipartisan group of Indiana state legislators from around Indiana for a Zoom briefing on anti-Semitism. AJC professionals, Lawrence Bolitan and Jacob Milner walk through the data and answer questions about national and global trends. And our JCRC professionals briefed our legislators on anti-Semitism that's occurring throughout Indiana, including on our college campuses. Our legislators were sobered by the information that was shared and we're confident that this program strengthened our bond with our allies in the legislature. Tonight's event featuring David Harris is one more example of this growing partnership, which we value greatly. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Lawrence Bolitan, the executive director of AJC Chicago and formerly an active member of our Indianapolis Jewish community. Thank you, Miriam. And thank you to the staffs of the JCRC and the Jewish Federation of Greater Indianapolis for collaborating with the AJC Chicago Regional Office in tonight's program. This event is particularly meaningful to me, as you've heard, since I had the true honor to call Indianapolis home for over a decade. AJC is the leading global Jewish advocacy organization. From city halls to Capitol Hill, at the UN and in the world, in world capitals, AJC works to advance the well being and security of the Jewish people and all people of goodwill. Our priorities include combating anti Semitism in the US and abroad, ensuring Israel's security and prosperity, and promoting pluralism and protecting democratic values. Our work takes form in four ways high level diplomacy with key global decision makers, legislative advocacy in support of our domestic and global priorities coalition building with other religious and ethnic communities and strategic communications to amplify and broaden our advocacy. With 24 regional offices in the United States, 12 overseas posts and 37 international partnerships, AJC's presence and impact can be felt all across the globe. We are a community of 2.6 million and growing each day, which includes the largest social media presence of any Jewish organization in the world. We invest in building relationships with leaders at the local, state, national, and international level. We know that the Jewish community in Indiana also values relationship building, and we've seen firsthand how partnering in some of these initiatives you heard Miriam speak about earlier really help us to achieve our mutual goals. Through these relationships, both JCRC and AJC impact opinions and policies on the issues that matter most to the Jewish people, rising anti-Semitism and extremism, defending Israel's place in the world, and safeguarding the rights and freedoms of all people. The Chicago Regional Office, which includes our outreach in surrounding states such as Indiana, welcomes you to learn more about our work at AJC.org or by getting in touch with me to discuss engagement opportunities. It is my pleasure to introduce Norman Kempler, a longtime supporter of AJC and a member of the Jewish community in Indianapolis to get us started with tonight's program. Norman. Unmuted now, yeah. Carol and I live uh, in Indianapolis. We have attended several AJC global forums. These meetings discuss the current issues involving the world Jewish community without sugarcoating. We have heard presentations by Angela Merkel and uh, Anthony Blinken, the current nominee for Secretary of State. David Harris has led AJC since 1990. He was described by Shimon Perez as the foreign minister of the Jewish people. His presentation tonight is entitled 2021, What Lies Ahead for Global Jewish Advocacy. Mr. Harris. Uh, Norman, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you. Uh, and I understand that we're going to have a moderated conversation with yes. you. So I'm going to turn the mic over to you, if I may. Yes, yes, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Norman, for introducing Davis, uh, David, and um, Lawrence, Miriam, uh, Debbie, 
Um, and of course, David Harris, who is joining us tonight. Um, my name is Lindsay Mintz, and I am the executive director of the Jewish Community Relations Council in Indianapolis. And I am truly delighted that we are all, including myself, going to learn from David Harris tonight. Um, it is my honor to offer the first set of questions. Um, and as I as we're in this conversation, um, I hope everybody will type their questions into the Q&A. After about 20 or 25 minutes, I will hand things over to Jacob Milner, who will field the questions from the audience. Um, can't have too many faces up here with you, sharing a little bit of the, the spotlight with you, David. So um, really, again, thank you. It is such an important time in our community, state, country, um, for Jews around the world, for Israel. I mean. It, you know, when, when we talked about having this um, program last fall, uh, we very consciously chose a date after January 20th uh, so that we could hear your thoughts on, on what is going on uh, in our country and um, with a new administration and what that might mean for our relationship with Israel. I'll get to that question in a second, David. But since we have um, several attendees tonight who might be new to American Jewish Committee, um, if there's anything that Lawrence might have left off in his summary, um, give us a sense of your priorities and how you've navigated those specifically just over the past year. Um, first of all, again, good evening to everyone. And um, I, I'm talking to one of my favorite states. Um, <laughs> I don't say that because I'm running for office and want your vote. <laughs> I say that because time permitting, Lindsay, and, and I know we're short on time. Uh, I have lots of Indiana stories, including um, a long relationship with, with your predecessor, Marsha Goldstone, especially during the uh, era of Soviet Jewry advocacy. Uh, I'm a longtime fan um, of Alvin Rosenfeld at uh, Indiana University. And I just need to add on a personal note, as a parent, I introduced two Indiana movies to um, our three sons at a very early age. And I think we've probably watched them each at least 20, 30, 40 times to the point where our kids knew uh, the text by heart. You can probably guess which films, one was Breaking Away, the other was Hoosiers. I can, I can still watch them as if it were the first time <laughs> and enjoy them. And of course, in the political space, um, Indiana has produced more than a share of national politicians. So I've had the pleasure of meeting some, working with others, observing some. So for all those reasons, plus of course, what Lawrence said earlier, which is, you know, we are seeking to deepen our relationship with Indiana. I'm so glad that the JCRC and AJC Chicago are focused more and more on joint projects. Um, I think it's terrific. So I'm here to lend my support to all of that. I don't really have much to add um, to what Lauren said. I mean, I could write a book on the subject of AJC history going back to 1906. You know, think, think of us as, as the front line, um, wh wherever it may be uh, with respect to both uh, Israel related issues and Jewish community related issues, when it comes to threats to the Jewish community, concerns about the Jewish community across the country, around the world, you're likely to find AJC there. In a typical year, Lindsay, we engage with about 115 countries, in addition to our work across um, increasingly close to all 50 states. We have bricks and mortar in only a fraction of those states, but as, as Lauren suggested, uh, and Jacob Milner, who's mentioned himself lives in Minneapolis, we see each of those sort of structures as, as, as a hub uh, and, and, and servicing a larger area. So, we're the global guys. <laughs> well, um, that um, is without a doubt true. Um, I didn't share in my quick introduction. I had the pleasure of attending just one global forum so far. It won't be my last. Which, which one? I, it was 2016. It was in DC. Uh -huh. And um, I was just, uh, first of all, impressed. As Norman said, these are incredibly impressive um, gatherings of world leaders, of uh, community leaders, of state leaders. Um, I think it really hit me when 
walking through one of the main thoroughfares, you know, there was a, um, a stack of materials and you can walk by and not really take notice and you think, okay, these are just pamphlets and you stop and you realize that they're AJC materials written in how many different languages, you know, and that, that this idea of, of a global Jewish advocacy um, organization is really, it's not just, um, you know, on paper, it is what AJC is doing. And you could feel that with every, every session that I attended. So it was very exciting. Um, and I and committed to not just going to another global forum, but also making it to Chicago when, when we are like, you know, in person again, going to one of the um, uh, opportunities to engage with local consulates and ambassadors. Okay, so let me, let me get to the good stuff here. On January 6th, uh, we witnessed a shocking assault on our democracy at the U.S. Capitol. Uh, tell us how AJC responded to what many refer to as the insurrection on January 6th. Um, I will, Lindsay, but I just have to bridge what you said at the beginning for a moment because 2016 um, achieved two notable things for me. Um, one was we had our first all-female um, gala program, which is the centerpiece of the Global Forum. You may remember uh, we had Susan Rice, who was then the National Security Advisor to President Obama, who has now come back as the head of the Domestic Policy Council. We had Federica Mogherini, who was the Foreign Minister of the European Union at the time. And, and this, in a way, begins to address your question. We had the Foreign Minister of Mexico, who in turn brought all 55 consuls general from across the United States to the AJC Global Forum, together with Mexican American leaders from each of those cities. Now, why is that important in the context of this discussion? Let me stress, AJC is a strictly nonpartisan organization. So please, please, please don't read into anything I say, you know, an, an attempt to lean in one direction or another. We're, 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 we're Jewish advocates. We're not Democratic Party or Republican Party advocates. But we invited the Mexican foreign minister in the midst of that election period because Mexico and Mexican Americans, including, as I recall, a judge in Indiana, were being targeted, were being sort of stereotyped, demonized um, in ways that we thought were antithetical to uh, core American values, including the core value of pluralism, mutual respect, which is at the heart of our vision of America. So we invited her, she, she, she was moved by the invitation. In turn, she brought the entire diplomatic corps of, of, of Mexico in the United States, which, is, which can fill an auditorium by itself, Lindsay. So that speaks to our values. Um, I, I wanna underscore that, it speaks to our values. So what, what we saw in, on January the 6th also challenged our values. It challenged our commitment to the rule of law, to the peaceful transfer of power, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the use of, um, of violence to achieve aims in this country. And on top of it, of course, there were those grisly photos that were captured of guy wearing Camp Auschwitz t-shirt. I'm sure everyone on this call saw it. You may have also seen the t-shirts which said 6MNE. And if you didn't, it took me a, a, a moment or two to figure out what it, what it was at the time. Six million, not enough. Um, so I can't tell you, Lindsay, how many of the people who were there in Washington harbored those views. I'd like to think it was um, just a few, but a few is, is, is way too many. And the others, even if they didn't, um, in some respect, validate or enable um, them by not by not distancing themselves from 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 those kind of virulent anti-Semites. I mean, can you imagine actually going out and buying and wearing a T-shirt that says six million not enough" uh, or Camp Auschwitz? So we 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 had a. a we had a vigorous discussion of our top lay leadership, our top staff, it lasted 90 minutes. And in, in, in something very, very uncharacteristic for AJC, I assure you, very uncharacteristic, 
we, we felt we had no choice but to speak up um, and, and to call um, uh, for the peaceful transition of power and therefore to, um, to ensure that Donald Trump would leave office on January the 20th and allow a peaceful transition of power. That's what we have. Just one, one other thought though, if I may, Lindsay, no matter, no matter where people fall on the political spectrum on this call, I believe, we believe at AJC as Jews, we have a stake in um, American cohesion. I'm not sure I'd use the word unity, though Joe Biden has, has been using the word a lot, but the glue that's holding us together is unraveling. I think we all know that. And it's not healthy. And AJC wants to be part of the effort to kind of rebuild bridges, um, rebuild um, the common space, the middle space, the search for consensus, for compromise, even at times for bipartisanship. I remember some, some Indiana senators who exemplified bipartisanship. Um, for example, in the field of, um, of, of post-Soviet nuclear activities. Uh, it, it more generally in the field of foreign policy. I, I don't want to believe that those days are all behind us. Uh, if they are all behind us, we're headed for trouble as a nation. And when this country is in trouble, Jews cannot sleep quietly. Thank you. Um, it's important, I think, that you not only acknowledge that the, the statement that AJC made, it's not that speaking up was unique. It was speaking, I think, as explicitly as you did about um, you know, naming um, uh, the former president. But I really appreciate you raising up that what's what's really inside of this whole conversation is um, the value of pluralism, bridge building, and recognizing that there there will continue to be these, you know, I don't want to say forces, but these the this attempt to pull apart and how much effort and work it takes to be the glue, not just for society generally, but within the Jewish community as well. Um, these conversations inside the Jewish community, uh, between the Jewish community and other communities are as important as, as ever. So we now have a new administration leading the executive branch of our government. Um, how will this, if at all, uh, affect AJC's priority issues? A lot. <laughs> I can leave it at that and let people speculate. Um, Look, this administration um, is um, defining itself in many ways as the antithesis of the last administration, which, by the way, defined itself as the antithesis of the previous administration, which, now we're in the Obama years, defined itself as the antithesis of the Bush administration. I'm not entirely sure that, as a nation, this is a very healthy process, where we kind of, we kind of lurch you know, 180 degrees here and then 180 degrees there. And, and each uh, administration is going to rescind the executive orders of the one before because the administrations could not achieve a sufficient consensus in the Congress. I mean, look, take for example, um, the Iran deal, which is obviously very much Lindsay on, on AJC's agenda, on our collective agenda. And just sort of follow it for a moment. 2015, the Obama administration, um, together with its partners, announces a deal has been reached with Iran, which became known as the JCPOA. Uh, the Obama administration tried to push it through the Senate to get the approval of the Senate so that it could, it could in fact be ratified as a treaty. But the Obama administration could not do it. In fact, 58 of the 100 senators, 54 Republicans and four Democrats opposed the deal. So it was never ratified by the Senate. Instead, therefore, the Obama administration went to the UN Security Council, hoping that th that would give it a kind of layer of validation. And the S Security Council did in fact uh, approve it. Along comes Donald Trump. Everyone knows the story. He says from the outset, 
this is the worst deal ever negotiated in American history. And by 2018, he pulls the United States out of the deal. Now he could do it because he could do it unilaterally because there was no congressional stamp of approval. But his action in turn can now be reversed by the Biden administration. Now, one can say, okay, fine, David, what's the big deal? Well, the first big deal is we don't look serious as a country. Um, and that matters because America is and needs to remain the most powerful and influential country um, in the democratic world and in the larger world. And if our own allies, not to mention our adversaries, can no longer necessarily rely because they don't know from year to year, are we in, are we out? What's the story? That's not great for American credibility and credibility is important to um, our security and our deterrence and our defense. So that's just one illustration, Lindsay, of, of, of how this lurching is not really helping us. And by the way, just to finish the thought, if Joe Biden continues to reverse the Trump executive orders and he's doing many of them, but he's not able to push them through a divided Congress, then in four years or eight years, a Republican president could come along and guess what? <laughs> Tear them up one by one by one. So I, I think there's gotta be a better way. You know, you you led us into a conversation about uh, the Iran deal and I'd like to, to be there for a minute, not too long. Um, I've been the director of the JCRC since uh, 2012. And so I had um, a couple years under my belt as director, having worked for my predecessor, Marsha Goldstone, for several years before that. But, you know, I can, I can very well recall the conversations around the Iran deal within the Jewish community in the many months leading up in the discussion, I'll say, using a, a euphemism. Um, you know, I guess my question is, how, how can we do this? How can we have this conversation as a community again, and maybe have it not be uh, quite so painful while still keeping our eye on, you know, the, the goal, what, what all of us agree we want, which is for Israel to be safe in a very unsafe um, neighborhood. Well, just, just tell me, Lindsay, because I don't recall, did the JCRC or the Federation in Indianapolis end up taking a position or not? We issued two statements that were, that, that were lengthy and that expressed concerns, um, but did not go so far as to um, make a statement one way or the other. But, but they listed out why some people right. have concerns, why some people are supportive. Right. So my guess is that that was probably a result of, of divisions within within the community. Um, I, I may be wrong, but this was certainly the case in many other communities where CRCs and federations had a lot of difficulty uh, because this became such a heated issue and people on both sides um, in, in, in our community raised the temperature in some cases. Uh, e even threatening with donations to either to withhold donations if the, if the quote wrong position were taken. So, uh, you know, your parent body, the JCPOA, uh, did not take a, a formal position. Um, and, and some federations did and others did not. And uh, <laughs> I'm not sure the federations will do it again anytime yeah. soon um, because well, it well, was. Well, what will AJC, how is AJC approaching well, this conversation? Well, see, we're in a different position because we have to take a position. I mean, this, we're a global player. Um, we play in what play. We play in Washington. We have an office in Paris. We have an office in Berlin. We have an office in Brussels. These are all places where decisions are being made. We have an office in Israel. Uh, we travel to Beijing. Uh, we've traveled to Moscow. So for us to avoid a decision would be in a way ducking our responsibility. So what we did in 2015, the, the announcement was made on July 14th in, from Vienna. We have a deal. 
And what you saw very quickly, Lindsay, was a lot of the sort of ideologues in the Jewish community on both sides lining up. So without even reading the deal, for example, the folks who believed in President Obama immediately lined up and gave them gave him the support uh, that, that they were seeking. The so people who despised President Obama immediately lined up in opposition. We didn't take either group very seriously because to us that, that was not that was that was kind of a reflexive ideological response. And here's where AJC and you know this is the part that Lawrence Bolton and I don't get to talk about a lot. We took 23 days with our lay leadership and we went through the deal. And we, we spoke with everyone involved with the deal. John Kerry, Secretary of State, who had a broken leg at the time, you may remember he had a bicycling accident in France. Mm -hmm. He actually flew up from Washington for a 90 minute meeting with our top leadership at AJC, a private meeting to persuade us to support the deal. Wendy Sherman, the Under Secretary of State, who was the chief negotiator, came up separately from Washington, also spent about 90 minutes. We spoke with the Israeli government. We spoke with the Israeli opposition. We spoke with our friends in Europe. The whole point was to circle the deal substantively and not ideologically. And in the end, Lindsay, we opposed the deal. Um, but we did so in a way that I think was, I'd like to think was thoughtful. By the way, we also said, we hope we're wrong. And if we're wrong, we'll be the first to say it. And one of the prouder moments for me was when a senior Obama official, with, whom I sat next to at dinner, whispered to me, he, he couldn't say this in front of the whole table. He whispered to me, David, I, I read the AJC statement if I were to oppose the deal, that's the statement I would have written. Mm -hmm. It was respectful, it was thoughtful, it was non-ideological. And I have to say, Lindsay, we were right. We were right because now all of the flaws that have emerged about the deal, all of the flaws that are being discussed, um, the sunset provisions, the weak inspection provisions, um, the absence of, 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 of ballistic missile um, uh, uh, sanctions, regional behavior, are all things you'll find in our 2015 statement. We said them, we said them politely, we said them respectfully, but we made clear, uh, and if the Biden administration is going to go back into the deal, you can be sure that AJC will have another similar process. In a way, we've already begun it in order to offer our views before any deal is reached. Uh, but this is not one we can duck. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. And you anticipated um, my next, what would be follow-up questions if the whole conversation were focused on the Iran deal. I have a feeling there'll be time for webinars specifically on that topic in the, in the coming months. Um, but I really appreciate your going into some detail um, about the time that you took and the thoughtfulness and, and that we are in a different place than we were four years ago, um, five years ago. We know a lot more um, and, and hopefully uh, more voices will be at the table, you know, if this process in some way starts again. But we're in the Middle East. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the Abraham Accords. This has been a remarkable paradigm shift in the dynamics of the Middle East. Um, how do you think the Biden administration will approach these agreements and this new peace paradigm? So let me just add one PS to the previous conversation and go right into the Abraham Accords. We also had in 2015, Lindsay, a very unique situation. Every major Israeli leader, um, government and opposition, um, stood together in opposition to the deal. Yes. So if if an American Jewish group, be it a CRC, a federation, or, or a global agency like AJC, wanted to support the deal, then they, they, they needed to have the humility to be able to say, we support the deal, not because we believe it's in Israel's best interest, but mindful that the Israeli leadership itself believes it is not in Israel's best interest. Maybe they support the deal because they think it's in America's best interest and those those interests with Israel diverge. 
but what, what we had was what, what, what to me was a bit of, 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 of hypocrisy of some groups calling themselves pro-Israel and insisting that their support for the deal was based on their pro-Israelism. And yet, how could that be um, reconciled with the fact that every major Israeli leader um, opposed the deal? So that, 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 that's for a longer discussion, I understand. Uh, yeah. On the Abraham Accords, look, I, I, you know, again, in a nonpartisan fashion, um, uh, the Trump administration has to get a lot of credit. Uh, you know, th th there's no way around, even for opponents of the Trump administration, acknowledging that um, this was their this was their high watermark. Um, they broke a negotiating paradigm over many years, Lindsay, which insisted that all roads to Arab-Israeli peace ran through Ramallah. Well, lo and behold, it turned out that all roads did not lead through Ramallah. And just to hammer home the point, for those on this call who may not have seen it, when John Kerry was Secretary of State, he spoke at the Brookings Institution in December of 2016, just before the transition. Uh, he spoke on the record, it, it's available. And he asked himself the question in front of the audience, can Israel make a separate peace with Arab countries absent peace with the Palestinians? Lindsay, did you, ever, did you see that segment? I, I don't think I did actually, but I can- go, I, look, go look for it. And when you find it, please send it to everyone on this call. Yeah. And John Kerry, as Secretary of State, responded to his own question with four, not one, four emphatic no's. No, 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 and no. Israel cannot make a separate peace. Well, irony of ironies. The first no became the UAE. The second no became Bahrain. The third no became Sudan. The fourth no became Morocco. Plus, though we did reach normalization deals, we made big headway with Saudi Arabia. We made big headway with Oman. Uh, we made some headway with Mauritania. And even more distant Indonesia is kind of beginning to open up a bit more. So the question for me is number one, will the Biden administration take a page from the Trump administration, even though it may not want to acknowledge it for obvious reasons and say, you know what? All roads don't necessarily lead through Ramallah. And number two, will the Biden administration um, support the deals that were made with, with each of the countries um, that were part and parcel of, of, of the accords. So, I mean, everyone knows with the UAE, it was F-35s. Uh, with, uh, with Morocco, it was recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over the, over the Western Sahara, et cetera, et cetera. And we're hoping the answer will be yes. And we're hoping that the Biden administration will, um, will seek to expand the Abraham Accords. Uh, in the interests of regional peace and, and frankly, in the core interests of the United States. Yeah. Regional peace is in the core interest of the United States. It's not just in Israel's interests or the UAE's interests, it's in our nation's interests. It is, um, it is remarkable. Um, I, I, I've heard you speak on the sort of the long history of, um, of anti-Semitism, of, of Jewish agency in the world. Um, and to think that it's been 10 years since the Arab Spring, um, five years uh, since the um, Iran deal, and here we are at the beginning of another decade having seen these Abraham Accords come in and knowing that, that this is the beginning, hopefully, um, it's very exciting to think about what those relationships will bring um, for obviously for Israel, um, not just the relationships, although I think you and I would agree, relationships, this idea that, that everyday Israelis are engaging with everyday Bahrainis or Moroccans or Sudanese, you know, that, that people will actually get to know each other. Um, that's not to dismiss some of the, the concerns that, that some people have about, um, about some aspects of these deals, but I certainly hope that relationship-wise, they are, an a seed that is um, 
that is watered and tended to because um, it's very, it is very exciting. So I'm going to ask one more question if I Let's can. See, can, I, can, I, can I add one more seat to your, to your garden? Sure. <laughs> At yes. least one. So today is what, January 25th? So a year ago, January 23rd, uh, a delegation from AJC um, stood at the entrance to Auschwitz. And we waited for 62 Muslim leaders from 20 countries, led by the Secretary General of the Muslim World League, headquartered in Mecca, Mecca, Saudi Arabia, to arrive as our guests and to join us for a day long visit to Auschwitz and Birkenau openly with the press following, with coverage by the New York Times, the BBC, Al Arabiya, you name this English, Arabic, there they were. The next day they joined us in Warsaw. They joined us in the synagogue of Warsaw. And the head of the delegation stood on the bima and he said to the standing room only um, uh, audience, he said, um, anyone who denies the Holocaust is engaging in modern day neo-Nazism. Now, dial back to Saudi Arabia and the madrasas and the textbooks and the teaching of, of anti-Zionism and the peddling of anti-Semitism. And now fast forward to the head of the Muslim World League based in Mecca, appointed by the king of Saudi Arabia joining the American Jewish Committee in front of the world's media to affirm what happened in Auschwitz and maybe the most moving moment of all, Lindsay, was within 30, 40 feet of the remnants of the crematoria in Birkenau, the 62 Muslim leaders brought out um, prayer rugs and conducted a memorial service for the victims of Auschwitz and Birkenau. It's not gonna change everything overnight, Lindsay, but something is happening and it's encouraging. And it's happening even in Saudi Arabia and it's happening in the Abraham Accord countries and it's happening in the other countries I mentioned. And look, we still have big challenges, big threats, no one's minimizing them, but suddenly they're competing with opportunities. Something is changing. And our message to the Biden administration is nurture it encourage it, strengthen it. Uh, it's in everyone's interest to do so. I'm so glad you reminded us about that. Um, I followed the news coming out of uh, Poland a year ago very closely. It was, um, it was jaw dropping in many ways. And, you know, I've said this to, to Lawrence, um, when we talk about the work of AJC on a national and international level. So there's an an incredible international effort on a national level, your relationships with the Urban League that it was the Urban League that um, the National Urban League that AJC partnered with for Jewish Unity Week. When national organizations step into that space and build those relationships, um, it is, it is, uh, it's not just, I, I, it's not just a photo op. This is what local leaders look to. I mean, and I know, and I, and of course, I, I, I don't, didn't even want to use that phrase, but, but some people might look at that and say, eh, you know, but, but we on the ground building these relationships with local leaders in the Black community, local leaders in the Muslim community, we can go and say, look, at, at, imagine um, what, what has un, unfurled here um, for this to take place whether it's in DC or halfway around the world. And it's been a huge, it's something that we look to and point to when we're building relationships on a local level. So I just wanna- Right, so Lindsay, so I, you know, again, for, especially for newcomers to AJC, two, of the, two of, the, of the biggest challenges we set for ourselves in the 20th century were um, defining a relationship with post-war Germany. Far from an easy task, but mm -hmm. The fact that, 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 um, that some of your colleagues saw Angela Merkel on the AJC stage was not an accident. It was an outgrowth of what began in 1949, 1950, and very painfully, but look what it's yielded. And not just 
the fact that she's on our stage, the fact that Germany is vital, I use the word vital, to Israel's core strategic and security interests. We set a goal of revolutionizing relations between Catholics and Jews against the backdrop of centuries of Catholic teaching of deicide, of teaching of contempt. Um, and look what happened in 1965, the Second Vatican Council, and look at the revolution in Catholic Jewish relations. AJC was a major player on both. In the 21st century, Lindsay, our, our major such challenges are now Muslim Jewish relations on the one hand, and on the other hand, fostering an entirely new conversation with the Arab world, Israel, and Jews. And we are determined in this century um, to, to, to make progress, and the first 21 years suggest some progress has been made. So I'm going to I'm going to um, ask one last question, and then um, Jacob Milner will come on and, and go through the many questions that have come through the feed. Um, AJC released a landmark survey on anti-Semitism uh, just at the end of last year. Um, you focused on the United States. Um, what were the main takeaways? I mean, combating anti-Semitism is no small feat, whether we're doing it you know, at the school down the street or around the world. Um, how is AJC, you know, where is AJC's role in this global fight? Oh, uh, I was hoping you'd ask me a yes or no question so I, I <laughs> could give a shorter answer and get to, get to the questions um, that Jacob is, um, is, is moderating. Um, look, the survey, which is available, uh, at AJC.org um, is worth a much more careful review than we can do right here, Lindsay. But just a couple, and, and there were actually two surveys. There was a survey of American Jews and their perceptions of anti-Semitism, and there was a separate survey of Americans generally and their perception of anti-Semitism. So it's worth reading both, and it's worth comparing the two. I'll just give you one or two notable sort of highlights. The rest Again, maybe Lindsay, with your help, you can send links. Uh, among Jews general, excuse me, among non-Jews generally, Americans, 21% do not understand what the term anti-Semitism even means. Another 25% are confused about what the term means or how to apply it. So 46% of all Americans, 18 and older, according to this representative sampling, um, cannot even evaluate our concerns about anti-Semitism because they don't even have yeah. the tools, they said, to begin the conversation, number one. And on the Jewish side, as you would imagine, anxiety about anti-Semitism is increasing. Um, and there are some startling numbers about Jews who have chosen to avoid a Jewish event. In this respect, Zoom may be a, a, a blessing because, because the survey is telling us that people, in some cases, have stopped attending a Jewish event or have stopped wearing something that might make them identifiably Jewish. Um, a lot of this is online, but not only. We have shared the results with the FBI. We had an in-depth meeting with the FBI, as we did last year after the last survey. And I'll just give you one, not AJC, but FBI statistic. Some 60%, 60%, of all religiously based hate crimes in America in 2019 were against 2% of the population, us. So while we can talk about concerns about crimes targeting Muslims, Catholics, Protestants, Sikhs, Buddhists, 60% of all religiously based bias crimes in America, according to the FBI, are directed at just 2% to the population. That underscores the challenges we face. I can't help but ask one more. Jacob, you can come <laughs> up. If I don't see your face, then I'll just keep rattling off uh, questions because- By the way, Lindsay, my next meeting is not till eight o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'm in well, absolutely no rush. You know, I alluded to this earlier. Um, I've heard you speak about, like I said earlier, this long, long view of anti-Semitism, you know, how, how are you feeling right now? Uh, <laughs> the, the statistics 
well, you know, continue to be alarming. I can tell you from my my front row seat of what's happening in Indiana, there's been a steady uptick since 2014. We started really tracking it 2014, 2015. Um, we have thankfully uh, instituted several programs that we think are proactive in helping to prepare members of the Jewish community and young people specifically, and also raise the education level of teachers, civic leaders, uh, policymakers, you know, but, but the, but it is alarming, is it not? Uh, it's alarming uh, because I think most of us were caught off guard. In other words, we really thought, I mean, if one looks back in the post-war period, whether one was alive or not, but if one studied it, then see, this really became the golden era for American Jewry. I mean, this was the era beginning in the late 40s, 50s, where all the barriers to full Jewish participation in the life of America came down one by one by one. I mean, I remember when I think it was Irving Shapiro was named as the CEO of DuPont. And what was the subtitle? First Jewish CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I actually served on a committee at the University of Pennsylvania, which I attended, to select the next president of the university in 1970. We happened to select a Jew. His name was Martin Meyerson. Little did I know at the time that he would become the first Jewish president of any Ivy League university in American history. And parallel to us, we discovered that Dartmouth had selected a Jew and suddenly the floodgates opened. Or think to the year 2000 and Joe Lieberman's candidacy. Again, I say this as a nonpartisan. Joe Lieberman wasn't just Jewish. Joe Lieberman was a serious Shomer Shabbat Jew whose wife's name was not Muffy or Puffy. His wife's name was Hadassah. And what America was saying in 2000 was, we're ready for this. We're a different America. So I won't even mention the impact of something like Seinfeld. I'm not even sure everyone understands that watching Seinfeld, they're watching quintessential New York cultural Jewish humor. And then, so we were really unprepared in many ways, Lindsay. Um, so we have to deal with, number one, the fact that anti-Semitism comes in multiple forms. I, I know for many, they see it coming principally from one source. I get that. But I, it's coming physically from one source, but intellectually from other sources. Um, it's going to challenge us in the school systems because of, uh, of ethnic studies curriculum, a curriculum in places like California which largely created a hierarchy of ethnicities and Jews kind of fall pretty low on, the, on, on that hierarchy. We've been fighting that. Uh, and I'll just give you one other example. In addition to the Camp Auschwitzes and the Charlottesvilles and the Paulways and the Pittsburghs and the Jersey cities and the Brooklyns, I'll give you another challenge we face. So um, I'm proud to say that I have a son who's a doctor. This is the Jewish father, Kfali. <laughs> Um, okay, so our middle son is a doctor. He's a, a frontline doctor in one of the largest public hospitals in New York City. It's in the Bronx. It's associated with Albert Einstein Medical Center for those who know the sort of lay of the land. In that hospital, Lindsay, there are close to 200 interpreters for up to 200 languages for the patient load. There are eight different dialects just for the country of Guinea in Africa. The vast majority of the patients are on Medicaid, 99%, the hospital says, and the vast majority have never met a Jew. That doesn't mean they haven't formed an impression of a Jew. Maybe from their church or their mosque or the internet or or, 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 or ether, my son um, sees himself in the community relations business, like you and me. What does he do? He wears the Star of David with his scrubs. You know, the male scrubs are V-necked. So he wears the Star of David to be sure that every patient, all the Yemenis, all the Bangladeshis, all the Albanians, all the Africans, all the Latinos know 
that when they're with him, they're being treated by a Jew. But what am I saying, Lindsay? In addition to the, the problems we're facing in places like Charlottesville or January the 6th, we're facing a whole other set of challenges, which is this rapidly changing demography of America reflected in a place like Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patients a year, again, almost all of whom have never met a Jew. What, what, what impressions will they have? Where will they get those impressions from? How will they operationalize those impressions? Will they be positive? Will they be negative? Will they become political, electoral? We have a massive job to do in the community relations field. No one organization can do it alone, but working together, CRCs in Indianapolis and federations and national agencies like AJC, um, we have no choice. We have to do it. And the sooner the better. I, I appreciate that so much. I say over and over um, to just about anybody who will listen, David, that um, when somebody says, well, what can I do? Huh. Uh, I say you can be willing to lead with your Jewish self in whatever conversation you're having. Good for you. Everybody did that. Wear that um, scarf, David, um, in the V of your scrubs if you're a doctor. Well, yeah, well, I, 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 I think, I, I, I think you're wearing the scarf, David. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I know that um, we have people listening in on what I feel like is a, a conversation just between you and me. So I will turn it over to Jacob. I so um, enjoyed tonight, and I know that there, there, would, there could be many chapters to follow. Um, oh, boy. And, and I would look forward to that really genuinely. Jacob, tell us about what, what uh, the 64 people joining us tonight are thinking and would like to ask David. Yes, thank you, Lindsay. Hello, David, good to see you. Hi, Jacob. How are you? you, you um, by the way, I hope everyone on this call knows what they call the Jews in Minneapolis. The answer is the frozen chosen. Right. I consider myself <laughs> truly blessed to be one of them. I just wish there wasn't two feet of snow outside. I'll back. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, we did get a lot of good questions in the chat, and I know we're running short on time, so I will just ask uh, one or two of them here. Um, the first question is, and you led off by talking about how AJC is a, 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 a bipartisan, nonpartisan organization. Uh, but I think we can all agree that there are issues when it comes to the left wing of the Democratic Party in regards to Israel. And so one question asked, uh, how, do, how do you think that AJC and other Jewish organizations can best respond to the left wing of the Democratic Party uh, with respect to uh, Israel? Well, thank you. And that's actually a question that touches Minneapolis very directly. <laughs> yes, it does. So you, you should be the one to answer the question, Jacob. <laughs> I'll let you do it. <laughs> next, next time, I'll, I'll turn the tables on you. Um, look, I, I, think there, I think there are two aspects to my answer. The first aspect, um, and again, speaking telegraphically, is, um, uh, is our hope and our effort to try and strengthen the moderate or, if you will, establishment wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, there is a, what the Germans call a Kulturkampf, um, a cultural war inside the Democratic Party. And by the way, now we're also beginning to see the Kulturkampf in the post-January 20th Republican Party to capture the soul of each party. I believe that we have a stake um, in the moderate wing of the Democratic Party um, prevailing and the moderate wing of the Republican Party prevailing as well. So that, that's, that's point number one. Uh, and point number two is we have to explore where and when it's possible to engage the left wing of the party realistically in conversations that may begin to um, puncture their, their ideology. Now, in some cases, Jacob, we've concluded it's not gonna be possible and it's largely a waste of time, but not in every case. Um, so we need to evaluate case by case, individual by individual, freshman member of Congress by freshman member of Congress. Um, with whom can we speak? Uh, I'll give you just one great example. Um, there is a new member of Congress from here in New York City, from the South Bronx. Uh, his name is Richie Torres. It's actually the district that 
is just to the south of Alexandro Casio Cortez. So in many ways, they're both of Latino background. Uh, they both come from similar neighborhoods, if you will, but they have very different outcomes. Richie Torres has said, and Jacob, you follow this for AJC, um, I'm a progressive. You're gonna see me on the progressive side of all kinds of domestic legislation. And when it comes to Israel, I believe that as a progressive, I wanna support Israel. I wanna support Israel. Now, how do, we, how do we understand his thought process in reaching that conclusion? And then how do we utilize people like Richie Torres to help persuade other people in the progressive camp that there is no contradiction between being a progressive and by the way, supporting the most progressive liberal democracy in the Middle East, which happens to be Israel. That, those are very good questions. And I think that looking at um, Richie Torres as a, uh, as a bellwether, I think is a thing that we can talk more about in moving forward and engaging with people on the left. And partner with him, Jacob. So that so we're partnering with him so that he, he will lead the charge even more than AJC or the CRCs. Let people like Richie Torres lead the charge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I will ask one more question here because I think we're already over time and then I'm going to turn it over to Beth to wrap it up. But the final question here, it's a simple question. <laughs> uh, is, will AJC work, uh, how will AJC work with the African, African American community? Uh, with the most pressing and promising initiatives of the Biden, Biden administration, particularly on issues of voting rights and other areas of civil rights? Well, it's a simple question with... with, with um, <laughs> <laughs> there are no simple questions, David. <laughs> with an answer that, that, that really should take more than a sentence or two. But <clears throat> look, um, again, I wish we had more time. Uh, perhaps there'll be a chance for a second conversation, I, I would certainly welcome it in Indianapolis. Um, but the African-American community is not a monolithic community, by the way, any more than the Jewish community is a monolithic community. And when, 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 when Lindsay referred to the National Urban League as our partner, that was not a coincidence. That was, that was our sense that, that of all the major African-American organizations today, the one that we saw ourselves reflected in the most, the one that we felt was most like-minded was the National Urban League. So uh, we're not ready to embrace every agenda item of every African-American group or individual out there. We have some major concerns, for example, about critical race theory, about which we don't have time to talk today. Um, we have some major concerns about how far the issue of identity politics goes. We have some major concerns about the battle between 1619 and 1620, if you will, as the starting point for America and defining the narrative of American history. These are very complicated issues, more than we have time for in the last question. <laughs> um, when we're running late, I understand. But the same nuance that we bring to other issues, we bring to these issues as well. We have been involved with the African-American community for well over a century, well over a century. We intend to continue, we intend to deepen it. We work closely with the National Urban League, we work closely with the Congressional Black Jewish Caucus, which we helped launch in 2019. Um, so we're sticking with it, but in sticking with it, as I said, and I want to stress, it doesn't mean embracing every idea out on the table put out by every organization. Um, that's not the way AJC approaches issues and policies. Thank you, David. And uh, like you said, these are questions that deserve much longer uh, answers all in themselves. Uh, and I know we're over by a few minutes here, so I wanted to turn it over to Beth Clapper, uh, who I think is coming online right now to, uh, to wrap it up for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, David, for such an insightful discussion during such a critical and challenging time in our history. We are really grateful for the work of AJC around the world and that you have dedicated your life to advocating on behalf of world Jewry. We look forward to strengthening the relationship between our Indianapolis JCRC and the AJC and expanding your footprint throughout Indiana. Now for a brief Federation update. 
Um, the Federation just formally kicked off our 2021 annual campaign. We are eagerly raising the funds necessary to help support the increased needs that we are continuing to see here at home due to the pandemic and the continued economic downturn. On an annual basis, the Federation considers local community building needs and global shared responsibilities and then allocates those funds raised accordingly. The impact of this collective funding of Federation allows us to meet the needs of our Jewish community constantly and consistently, no matter how far reaching, no matter where in the world Jews may be. We have some great upcoming um, relevant programs to share with you. And please take a look, um, moment to look at uh, a couple of these highlights and as well as our Federation calendar um, on the website. We've got uh, upcoming, we've got a two Bishvat miracle uh, called in Jurassic Park in Israel that is on January 26th at noon. And I think we've got the link here to, um, to register at. We also have an upcoming program, um, the 2021 Davis Family Forum featuring Dr. Bernice King. And that's Tuesday, January 26th at 5.30. Next, we have a uh, program entitled, What Does the Vaccine and COVID Relief Mean for Me and My Community? And that's Wednesday, Jan January 27th at four o'clock. And as a reminder, it's Jewish Disability Advocacy Month. And some uh, good information on that link. Next, we have a virtual mission trip to Washington, DC, um, January 1st through the 2nd. And the AJC, looks like the AJC community, uh, Chicago Community and Conscious program that you can see the link there. And uh, moving forward in 2021 on Racial Justice and Equity, we have a program on Tuesday, February 9th, um, featuring Christopher Wilburn, Ashley Gervitz, uh, Amp Harris, and Shoshana McKinley Balden. Um, and there's the registration information, I believe, on the JCRC website. And uh, one other program in, uh, entitled In Doubt or Living Without food insecurity during COVID. And this is our women's philanthropy um, event on Thursday, February 18th at seven o'clock, a virtual program. I think that's it. Um, a lot, lot going on. Please check our calendar, calendar for Federation to see many of these um, upcoming opportunities. And hopefully you can come um, back with us and, and share and participate in some of these virtual events. Lastly, I wanna thank you again to David Harris. That was amazing. Um, David really, really enjoyed it. Um, thank you as well to Debbie, Miriam, Lawrence, Norman, Jacob, and Lindsay. And of course, thank you to all of you for spending your evening with us. This concludes our program and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you very much.